I think that like blockchain is the ultimate uh, human coordination technology. And, and when you combine a human coordination technology with software's ability to, to build on, on the shoulders of the people who came before you, uh, you get this opportunity for a type of growth that's just really hard to like understand. It, it's much faster than anything we've seen in, in the past. Welcome to another episode of Curated by Quantstamp. I'm Tyler, and I'm here with Savvy. On today's episode, we have Justin Waldron from Storyverse. Justin was previously the co-founder of Zynga, which created the smash hit games such as Farmville and Mafia Wars. In the crypto space, he has advised companies such as Decentraland, CryptoKitties, and Immutable X, to name a few. With his new project, Storyverse, he is building a no-code game publishing tooling for PFP communities. So what does that mean? Well, basically, one, you can use their creator tools to make an interactive story of your PFP, which can bring your PFP to life. And also, it makes them more shareable online. And two, these will exist within a web browser. So rather than going to a virtual metaverse, which you know takes, which adds a lot of friction, um, you can get distribution of these stories through social media channels that we already use. So example would be Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, to name a few. Right. So in this episode, we talk a lot about specifics regarding Storyverse, like, you know, use cases, in-game currency, how will the Storyverse plots be used? And also we talked about broader stuff, like how Justin views the metaverse, the building blocks, etc. So beautiful episode gives you a lot of in-depth of like how this whole thing works. And, you know, Justin is so smart. I loved picking his brain about this stuff. Also, I would add one more thing. Definitely check out the white paper. Um, as I l read the white paper, this project started making more and more sense and it, it looked pretty interesting to me. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy the episode. One thing I loved you described, which was basically how you're looking at metaverse. You're not looking at it as this virtual land. You're, you're kind of taking it in baby steps in a sense, right? Like the next, next evolution of it is basically happening in the Web2 world. It's right. That's where the distribution is, right? Which makes total sense. I would love to know what's your view of how, how do you think about the metaverse will look like uh, from your, uh, you know, thinking as of right now and also like maybe like five years from now or 10 years from now, like how are you thinking about the evolution of metaverse? Yeah, everyone has a different definition of what the metaverse is, right? And uh, I've been in so many interesting panels and situations and conversations where where um, people are, are just talking about uh, the same word, but different meanings. For me, uh, I think the metaverse is about ownership and, and I, I think it's less about like the way the experience looks or the way it feels. And so, um, and I think for a lot of other people, they, they think the metaverse is all about it just being VR and ownership isn't even part of, of the equation. Um, so, I mean, I, I think that the term is, is getting used in, in so many ways right now that it's, it, it's, it's starting to be difficult to tell which part people are talking about, but we're, this is a blockchain podcast. So I'll focus on the ownership part. I, I think that, um, People have never been able to own things on the internet, right? And everything we've been using on these services, is, it's something we're, we're kind of just renting um, and we're getting access to it in that way. And this idea that you can you can own something and the number of utilities for, for what you can do with it can grow over time is, is super interesting. Um, and we're, we're building like layers of a new sort of world um, where you can go and use these items. And so our, our thinking is like, you can be in the business of, creating new items for this world, or you can be in the business of creating uh, like pools of utility for the items that already exist. And what we saw in, in, in games was that like there weren't enough people working on the utility side for, for the items that already exist. And there are a lot of people pumping out amazing, great content and NFTs already. And so our take on, on, on the metaverse was like, how do we go give context and life um, and new use cases to the things that are already there? And so, um, when I think about like what the metaverse becomes, I, I think it's, it's the very easy ability to seamlessly use and mix these things that you, you own in new and interesting ways. And so one example I like to give is TikTok um, did this huge licensing deal with the record labels to get access to all this commercial music. And it's a deal that takes a lot of effort to, to negotiate. Um, and what really came out of it was the ability for individual people 
to go make very interesting videos uh, with those songs in the background. The challenge that people always have is like to do that as an individual is, is basically impossible. Um, you can't go and show up to a record label and say like, I want to negotiate the rights for a single song for an artist that's, that's represented by one of those labels. It's, the, it's too expensive for them to do a transaction to negotiate these sort of terms to justify working with anybody but the largest companies um, where there's going to be like a real sort of opportunity to move the business with, with that deal. And so as a result, you have game developers like us um, who we'd love to work with all this different IP. We love to work with all these different musicians and these creative people, and they would like to work with us. Um, it turns out like every NFT project wants a game and every, every musician wants their music in the background of a game. Yet if you go in the app store, um, there's, there's a billion games, um, not literally, but it feels like a billion and, and they're, they don't have licensed music in the background. Why is that? It's because none of those game companies, no matter how large they are, can justify going, going and spending six months negotiating with a record label to get access to some music for the background of a game. But on the other side of the, the record labels, you have all these, these musicians who would say, you know what? I love to have my music in the background of these games because it's going to increase my exposure. And even if I don't get paid for it, maybe I would, I would give it to them. So like, what is the solution to this problem? I think this is part of what the metaverse does when if we can take the things that we own, including the rights that we have to them, and we can very easily without these high transaction costs or a middleman, uh, facilitate exchanging these rights, then suddenly it does make sense for some indie game developer to pay $100 on an exchange to get access to a song from some artist who's happy to give them those rights because they know that it's going to get more exposure for their, their music. And so this is the part of it that we've been, we've been very focused on, which is um, we don't think that people have yet realized how big of an idea that could be. Um, we think that there's a lot of content that's already on chain that supports this and it hasn't been unlocked yet. But the ability to sort of permissionlessly collaborate with creators who make amazing content means there's going to be a lot of great stories that can be told. There's going to be a lot of great games that can be created, a lot of great music that's going to be heard that otherwise wouldn't be heard. Just think about the hours that people spend playing games. It's what people spend the most time doing on their phone. And all of that music that's sitting in the background of those games is this royalty free music that those game companies had to buy or work with somebody to make because they couldn't just get the stuff that people actually want to hear. And that's all because of this problem of ownership and rights and the fact that you can't go and get a deal like that done. Blockchain solves that problem completely. Um, and, and, and the same thing happens on IP. Think about all the great movies that haven't been created. There's some story writer, there's some screenwriter who's written dozens of amazing stories that they then had to go pitch to a studio executive, but they can only make one Marvel movie per year or every two years. And that story has to be matched to that set of IP. They're not going to make 20 Marvel movies a year or a thousand, but there might be like, we don't know what the, the demand curve looks like, but there are business models that they have to bet on one. And so what happens when all those people who have amazing stories to tell suddenly can go pick up IP off the shelf and, and build a cast with characters they find on the blockchain that do have built in audiences. Um, we don't know. So like my, the way I look at it is it's back to this idea of like waste, right? We talked about in the beginning, every time somebody starts a new software company, you build 90% of this stuff that is boilerplate stuff. So you can build the 10% that's a new contribution in the world. And if your company doesn't work, all of it goes away forever. And then somebody has to rebuild it again and try and try again. And so you get this linear progress um, and creativity is the same way. So people write these amazing stories and 99% of them never see the light of day because we have to be de-risk, de-risk, de-risk. How do we match the single IP to the single story and, and try to make this the, the one thing that'll work this year instead of just um, having this, this system where there's a market for it and people can go and, and form these connections because the artists, the people behind these, this IP, they want to see all sorts of people able to build and create with their IP. The IP will grow. It'll become more popular. It'll become more val valuable. Um, and the storytellers, they, they want to use this IP so that they have built in audiences and, and you know, amazing communities attached to, to the, the story they're writing. So to me, this is like the great missed opportunity um, that, that gets unlocked 
over the next couple couple of years. And and I think it's it's related to the metaverse in the sense that it's all about it's all about ownership. Um, and part of ownership has always been about um, the ability to create a business. And if you think about like um, the inputs to a business, you you have assets and you have capital and and, and labor. And um, we we know that like there's a lot of capital uh, in, in the, on the blockchain, and and we know that there's a lot of people that are excited to contribute to to these projects. And now we have this new form of assets, which is IP. So um, that's that's the part that we're most excited about. I I don't you know I think avatars and all this other stuff that people talk about in the metaverse it's it's very interesting. Um, it's not necessarily new. Um, it, it's something that has existed for a long time. Like I've I built virtual worlds a decade ago that were that were like quite quite popular. Um, so it's something I'm interested in. But what I think is brand new, enabled by this technology, is is like. I have this thing, what are all the things I can do with it? And so that's what we're focused on. One thing that you talked about in a podcast I watched of you with uh, with Overpriced JPEGs and you were chatting about like, you know, how I'm going to quote you. You said something on the lines of we start from first principles. We look at the technology behind something and how, how, how we can make something more interesting and better from the building blocks that are there. And also how we can take that and let other people build from that. And then you mentioned kind of like how you saw that it was super aligned with Web3. I would love if you could expand on that. This idea of being able to build based on on top of what previous people have built or companies have built is what makes software engineering in, in general so powerful and so high leverage. And if you think about like what we've been able to do, even the largest commercial companies in the world are built on software that was built by communities. Um, so like Apple's OS is built on, on Linux, right? And this is an operating system that m- many thousands of unpaid contributors have built together. Um, and what's always fascinating me about Web3 and, and crypto is there's a more rigorous way of being able to organize those people and reward them for their contributions in a way where you can uh, sort of organize and, and pay people based on uh, their exact contribution that can be proven and, and sort of uh, commemorated on the chain. And so I think that like blockchain is the ultimate uh, human coordination technology. And, and when you combine a human coordination technology with software's ability to, to build on, on the shoulders of the people who came before you, uh, you get this opportunity for a type of growth that's just really hard to like, understand. It, it's much faster than anything we've seen in, in the past. So software has always had this ability to take something that somebody built before you, um, take their code and now build on the top of it. The problem is most companies don't work. And so we know most startups that build, they have to start by building all the things they need to have in order to support their new idea. And often their new idea is a small piece of the stack. And so if you're building a new fintech company, um, you, you have to go and build all the different pieces that support building a neobank before you can put your unique spin on it. And maybe your unique spin is like the, the way your credit card works or the interest rate and the way you do a loan, but you still have to go build that 80 or 90% of stuff over and over again. And Obviously, um, more and more SaaS companies have been coming into the space and providing these services so that you don't have to build it again. But that's taken a very long time because they have to find the right business model. They have to build the right tech. They have to survive. They have to get venture funding. Um, And so one of the things that's really interesting to me about blockchain is um, that these protocols can live whether the team survives or not. And it's a common thing that people say in the venture world, which is make sure you're not building a feature. Because if you go build a feature, for another product, like often you're in a position where your company's at risk and you can think about the, the, the products like uh, all when Twitter had an open interface and people built things like TweetDeck and all these other things you could use to view Twitter. And then one day Twitter decided they didn't want to support um, that type of API anymore and they were all gone. They were a feature and so they got crushed. And what's interesting about blockchain is you get rewarded for building a feature because actually like sometimes the highest leverage thing you can do is just build the block, the little building block that everybody else needs, and they can plug it in as a feature into their stack. And that's something that um, in many cases was impossible to do in Web2. And so when you look at a space like DeFi, um, how did it grow so quick? It's it's because instead of having 500 neobank companies that are all building 90% overlap in technology over and over again, so they can compete on that 10% that they didn't build that was the same, everybody got to pick out what was my building block in DeFi. 
Um, and they built those building blocks and everybody got to use everybody else's building blocks. And you constructed this thing that actually grows exponentially in complexity instead of linearly. Um, and so the, the thing that's fascinating to me is like DeFi surpassed fidelity in sort of like call it four years of development. And so when you start trying to project out what happens to something like games or, or music or any of these other um, spaces, it becomes very difficult because we're used to seeing one company go on its mission to build out a vision for the future, whereas blockchain is everybody building the vision for the future together. Um, and, and I think like that, that composability is what makes, it's like blockchain's secret weapon in my mind. Shifting this to Storyverse, how are you thinking about that when, when it comes to Storyverse? Like, how are you thinking about these building blocks and, and stuff like that? Yeah, well, a big part of it is, is IP, right? I mean, we're, we're looking at Ethereum and we're looking at these PFP projects and uh, part of the building blocks of making a successful entertainment project are one, IP, two, uh, capital, three, distribution and an audience. Um, and, and these are already baked into these projects. There's already people who love the Bored Apes. I mean, there's, they have a, a million followers on Twitter, even though there are you know, fewer than 10,000 holders. Um, and, and I think that this brand has outgrown the set of holders. And so what we have saw with PFPs was uh, they, they've been able to become part of the larger conversation because they don't require the people who are viewing them to actually be crypto users yet. Um, they, they don't ask that of, of the people who are experiencing them. And that's really powerful. So like, if you just think of the way that you usually get exposed to something, uh, a brand or, or an experience in your life, you often hear about it or you see it before you try it. And um, crypto is not very tangible. So that's been very difficult for a lot of people to do. But with NFTs, you can see it over and over. You can hear people talking about it. You can hear them talk about their experiences. And it's much more tangible and people have it as their, their profile picture. So the exposure is everywhere. Um, and then eventually you, you just get curious enough that you, you decide to check it out. Um, for us, like how does that connect to the building block piece? We think that um, many of these have the potential to be from the brands of the future and, and that they've amassed a group of people who are aligned in each community to go and build this brand um, and to build this IP but they don't have the tools to operate as a community and go and build some interesting things together. So individually you hold the rights to your ape uh, and you can use it commercially, but individually it's very difficult to build something where you really leverage IP uh, and in a way that's scalable. So you can go print uh, a t-shirt and make a coffee mug, but everybody knows that like entertainment is the most scalable IP based business, um, $150 billion a year in games. It's all IP based, uh, whether if it's not an IP that's being licensed from, from another entertainment company for a game company to build with, it's an IP that they've been developing for, for decades sometimes. And when you value the most valuable game companies in the world, you look at their franchises, like what are the IPs that they have that are lasting franchises? Because that's where you can really predict, uh, how successful they'll be in the future. And for us, like. We think that when this new type of brand is being built, um, entertainment and games are, are just one of the most interesting places. And so we think we can build the game design and the game engine piece that allows the IP holders to sort of plug it in and, and very easily without code, build a games business with the IP they own. So it's, it's about connecting multiple people within the system that have, that have different skill sets and making it so that any individual contributor can, can be a part of of creating like a new business without permission and without having to ask the other people to, to collaborate. And if you would think about like a couple of like real world examples where you think how this would play out as of right now, like if you, you know, if you were to say these are like user, user stories or like user boarding, like, you know, I can see this happening. Like what would be a couple of examples you think? Very practically speaking, because our product is, is very, uh, pragmatic it sounds it sounds like it's so far out there but you know it's already our game engine is built and, and these tools are internally we're, we're shipping the alpha soon so um i i think that you can imagine the most basic level you own a board ape um you want to create a small game that you can share on the web with your board ape right now to do that you'd have to hire game developers you'd have to rig and animate your board ape uh you'd, you'd have to like literally code the thing, take on, you need capital to go and pay these people and, and do all these, these things It would be expensive, risky, um, and largely like, you know, it, 
it probably wouldn't work out. Um, like we, we know how to build games that, that can be shared on the web and they load instantly. They work inside Twitter and Discord and Instagram or anywhere else people share them. And that's something that takes a ton of, um, a ton of work to, to figure out. And so we're providing that. And, and if you show up with your ape and you just want to build a game that you can then quickly share to your, your followers or something, say you're an influencer, say, say you just have a hundred people that follow you on Twitter. Um, and you just want to have a meme, you can go and you can create that in a minute. Um, like go in there, give a hot take on what happened with the latest news of the week. There's been a lot lately. So you can imagine someone having their ape giving some commentary on just the news that's been going on this week. And when you post it to Twitter, people are seeing an animated version of your ape talking, could be laughing, crying. All this stuff was as easy as using like iMessage and just sort of chatting out some speech bubbles plus um, adding some emoji. It's that simple, but you've created something, the output of which is, is an interactive cartoon where you can tap through these scenes. Um, and, and later, um, we, we allow for more complexity that lets you build sort of entire adventure games um, with this system. So it starts off as the most basic idea, which is telling a story in a very compelling format that's, that's native to the internet and the way people like to consume interactive content and video. Um, but it expands itself to allow uh, you to create a business on it because interactive media, like a game, has the hooks for you to actually allow for the users to take different actions that could cost cost money or you know create this pinch where you can actually monetize the content. And so um, we're basically giving a business in the box to anybody who owns IP. And interestingly, in crypto, for anyone that's participating in NFTs, most of them already own IP. They just uh, haven't really been able to use it in a very easy way yet. I also think it's interesting, another interesting part, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but if example, you share the cartoon version of it, and like you said, it's interactive, you can also track basically, uh, like you can actually get data on like what people really want. So what, you, what, your, what your followers really want. An example would be, let's say, uh, let's say if I'm a content creator and I'm saying it, with interactive format, I'm, I'm saying, Hey, do you want this or this? Like this, like Luna News or Azuki News, for example, right? Depending on who clicks where, you can actually track them. Which are your NFT followers and which are your which are your uh, crypto followers? And you can actually seg segment that content out as well and and actually put them in different. I'm guessing is that a we get thinking about that as well? Yeah. So there's a you can make choices in the story. So there's these multiple choice choices that can happen in the story, um, and you can have multiple characters and they can have a dialogue back and forth. And at some point, like it could be, do you take the red pill or the blue pill? Um, the red pill can be a free choice. And so everybody that's reading this, they don't even need to connect a wallet to read this. Okay. This is back to this idea of, of PFPs don't require you to be a crypto user to see them on Twitter. Um, and there's a million people following the Board Apes account, and there must be many of them without a wallet. This, this brand is bigger than, than crypto. Um, we, we want to build that same experience for games. So the, the right way to think about it is you're an IP holder and you're creating a game that other people can, can experience in a, a business that you can operate. Um, and you don't need to know, understand hosting or game development or any of that. It's all, it's, it's all part of the package. Um, and when you deliver that game to, to, to these people, they have the opportunity to just experience this content and say, oh, these apes are cool, they're funny. Maybe they do know who the board apes are, maybe they don't. Um, it doesn't really matter. But when they get to a certain point in the, in the, the story, you can say, do you want to take the red pill or the blue pill? These are choices that the creator decided. Red pill might be free. They don't need to connect a wallet. They tap red pill. They continue the story with the character taking the red pill. Blue pill could be actually what we call like a proof of choice NFT. Um, and the proof of choice NFT is I took the blue pill and there were 10 people who could take the blue pill and it cost 0.1 ETH to take the blue pill. And then now I have an NFT that proves that I, I did that. Um, and what's interesting about that is it's a way of supporting the creators who built the stories, but also you have an NFT that can be used for anything that an NFT can be used for, right? All the utility associated with it, future airdrops, whatever. Um, but then the story also, the story engine also allows you to read the wallet of anyone who's reading these stories. And so later, if you put out another story, you can say anyone who took the blue pill sees this in the story um, or has access to, to this part of the story. And so you can see that like the wallet becomes almost like a, an inventory for an adventure game where everybody who's telling stories with all their characters can be affected by all the decisions that people have made in any other story. And so it's sort of this uh, wide open world where we're all building our own games and our choices and our storylines with our characters 
but uh, we can look at the wallet of anything that you're doing on the blockchain and affect our story with that. Um, so we don't really know how people are going to use that, but it actually lets you build many different types of, of games. So like you can easily build a game with levels where you need to have taken the blue pill to see the, the next story and, 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 and the next scene in another separate story and another link. And so you could actually build an adventure game with that. And instead of taking the red pill or the blue pill, it could be, did you punch or did you kick this, this Pokemon, right? And, and these could be a fight system all of a sudden. And so if you think about what a game is, um, many games are like, you, you make a choice and there's some cost to making the choice. And then later the, the choices you make are you know limited based on the choice you made. And so even though the system sounds really simple, it, it basically opens up like uh, full scale RPGs that are sort of interoperable across all the different PFP communities. Um, so it's a simple system, but we think it's got a lot of depth. You know, it's interesting because I'm personally, I'm, a, I'm more of a utility guy. I'm not like a gaming guy, but I also see what you said in a utility world. Example could be, let's say a course creator, as a random example, right? Could make you actually, it could be a really good way of like rewarding people who actually watch a course, for example, because example would be in the, in the inf information world, 90% of the courses that get sold, uh, people don't watch it. Like only 10% actually have the watch rate, right? So you can actually kind of reward people based on how much they're watching. And like more they watch, the more you walk them down that path and more rewards they get, you can gamify it that way. So it could also be a, like a learning, I can see that being another interesting angle. So uh, it kind of reminds me of like a little bit of like a marketing, like an, like a tree, like a, I don't know what you call them, but like that email marketing tree or something where you kind of, Move, based on what action they took, they, you move them in a different bucket and, and you kind of put them in a different cohort, basically, but in an, entertain, an entertaining way. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, I think that the number of use cases for it, it's going to be tremendous. I think that there's a lot of use cases for it. And I think if you, if you think about all the brands who've been buying these NFTs to basically put out like a Twitter GIF or an image, they would, in many cases, prefer to do something like you said, where they can get input back from the user, right? If you get input from a reader, then you have all these other interesting things you can do. It's, it's, um, it's more about just like acknowledging the intent of the people who are reading it and, and understanding to your point earlier, what, what they want and, and making it fun. So like making choices is, is, is fundamental to what makes games interesting and fun. Um, and, and videos are really great and engaging and, um, they, this passive experience lets us just kind of scroll through our Twitter feed and, and see something that's, you know, more interesting to experience than reading some text. But this combination of like very, very lightweight text and the animation plus choices is, is like it's baseline. We call it like the minimal viable metaverse. So, you know, everyone is promising this idea of, of like a more in-depth metaverse. And we think that's interesting. But the problem is it's, it's hard to hop in and out of those experiences. And, and a lot of people are already um, Twitter is sort of part of the metaverse in our view where we're already spending our time with these virtual avatars on Twitter, if you think about it. Um, and Twitter is a space. And within that space, like you're, you're sort of looking for content with a certain amount of friction um, and, and a certain amount of upfront commitment. And so our goal with this is to make something that's so lightweight, you don't feel like you're hopping in and out of an experience. It's, it's like, it's part of the post that you saw. Um, it lives within social media and it's, it's like going in and out of it is totally seamless. And in that way, um, you're not saying like, am I going into such and such metaverse? If most people, they won't associate this with the metaverse. Um, but if, but it allows you to create a space with characters that, that have interactions, um, could be synchronous in the future, like where it's live interactions, but we're starting off with asynchronous, um, and, and allows you to make decisions in this space that ultimately affect the space at, at large. And to your point about like the reward, the rewards, um, we are going to create a system, like a very simple system for you to basically take like a box um, and put some NFTs inside of it or some token and use that box in the story as a way of rewarding people who get to that point in the story. And it may be blocked by they had to make a certain choice or not. And you contribute to that box, um, whatever you want as a creator, it could be any NFT that exists. Um, and so that lets you make a very simple uh, game feedback system. Like, like you pointed out, which is basically you come in, you see this great IP that you recognize, you, you watch the story, you laugh, it's funny, you make a choice, you're supporting the creator when you make that choice because you paid them some ETH. And on the other side of that choice, they could have like, you could have opened a box and inside that box could have been some other NFT that was of some value. Um, and in some cases, like 
the creator might decide that the NFT that's in that box is actually valuable. It could be it could be more valuable than what the choice was to take it. But maybe everybody who took the choice didn't get the box. Um, and so there's you know there, there's this ability like this is how games work, right? There's some probability that you get the the unlock of the item, um, and it costs something to do the action that that led to the to that situation. But if you think about that, like to get back to this this idea of building blocks, allowing people to monetize these choices, um, allowing them to unlock a reward. It, it could be any reward that comes from on chain, um, and then allowing people to tap through these experiences. We think it's like the simplest way to get people building games. So we don't call it play to earn because it's not really play to earn, um, but it, it plugs into any economy that's already on chain. And it's, it's, it's wide open enough that people can find all sorts of interesting use cases. It might be learning. Um, it might be any other number of, of things, but it's, it's basic building blocks to get interaction that's fun and interesting, basically. So within each uh, story versus plot, how does like the title of each plot and the characters that are on each one, how does that play into kind of how you just explained everything? Yeah. Yep. So we, we put titles in as placeholders. A lot of people are enjoying them. Um, the titles are not, they're, they're something that you will be able to change. So if you want to remove the content and start over or like modify it, that's, that's up to you. We just want to make sure that uh, there's no blank there's no blank spaces and that that'll help people when they first use the tool see oh, okay here's the title here's a story that they they built that was already here and it, it's like an easier way of getting an introduction on just how some of these things work um the characters that are that are in the plot are actually they're nfts that we own um and what we did was when we had the primary sale for our first drop of plots we took almost all the eth that that we earned from that sale and we bought a bunch of NFTs, and then we took some other NFTs that we had already purchased. Um, which, if we if we had bought them with a the primary sale, we wouldn't even have had enough ETH. We we had definitely at this point have sunk more money into this project than we've we've earned. Um, and we 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 took those characters and we sublicensed them into the plots based on these traits. So uh, we we wanted to make sure that anybody who who wanted to use a Storyverse did not need to have an NFT that was already integrated into the system. And, and so in that way, we, we decided, like we took a lot of popular projects that support this sort of licensing and we bought them and then we, we sub-licensed them and we made them traits on the plots. So every plot already has three characters that it can use. Um, and some are more rare than others, just like, you know, there's, there's different rarity traits on any other uh, PFP project or something like this. And uh, you'll be able to use those three characters when the tools come out to create your stories in addition to pulling in whatever NFTs you own that are supported. That's awesome. So there's, um, I think it's 200,000 total plots. And so far there is 3000 dropped. So is the plan to kind of see how it goes at first or are you like committed, like we're going to drop all of them in the next year, five years, I guess, how was that kind of planned out? Yeah. I mean, it's similar to, uh, the sandbox where like you know it'll probably take a while for for these plots to come out the land in the sandbox i mean they have a very similar quantity and and our thinking there is like we want to make sure that um when we release them like the tools are in the right place and the community is ready for us to release more plots and there's a lot of considerations so we are you know we want to grow the amount of people that can use the platform and so ultimately like we, we need more plots out so we can have more holders right um but our main priority right now is like getting feedback on the tools, which we'll be dropping um, this month, the, the alpha for these tools. And so like, we wanna work with like a, you know, our, our community to improve the tools, get like a really strong uh, product market fit, get the people who are using them, enjoying them, have more and more people see the content so they understand what you can do with it. Um, and then we'll start probably selling more, more plots when we feel like the market is ready for it. We're not in a hurry. Um, I think Sandbox probably took like at least a year to sell all their land. So, but it'll, it'll really depend on where the project goes. So I don't know if how true this is, but in the discord, people were saying like, oh, like the, the earlier the plots are released, like the, the better quote unquote or more utility it has. Is there any truth to that or not really? Well, so the, the stories are, they're next to each other, right? So similar to land in the metaverse where there's X, Y coordinates and you can traverse from one place to another, who your neighbors are matter matters. Um, and 
we also will have stories where like when you get to the end of one story, it'll be very easy to go to the next story and you may not own that next story. So, so there is going to be some interesting thing about like which stories are popular and who, who are your neighbors. Um, when it comes to like coming first, I mean, the way that our, our plot map works right now, it, it does start at the top of the list, right? So like if you're the first story in there, you're going to get some, a lot of free notoriety with people who are going to the plot map. Um, I'm not really sure in the long run, like if it'll always start in, at the top of the list. That may not be the best experience for people when they have to scroll through 200,000 plots. We'll, we'll have to like continually revisit that. So I think for in the near term, it, it definitely seems like there would be some advantage to um, discovery from being in like the first and earliest set of, of plots. But in, in the long term, I mean, to be completely honest, there might be like somebody like Jay-Z owns plot 100,000 and he put it as bio link on Twitter. And, um, you know, you want to be 100,001 because there's so many people going to his story that uh, you're getting a bunch of free like traffic toward the end of his story for being the next neighbor over. Um, and so that'll be like a dynamic situation that's changing where you're, you're kind of paying attention to like which stories are popular and in the adjacent plots. So um, that's going to be something that's highly dynamic, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Tyler. I think you were kind of saying like compared to like how BAYC when they did their land where the, you know, the all the apes got the the nice land and then mutants got a little ni less nice. I just like, I wasn't sure if there was like, you know, if, if the earlier plots, let's say you can make like a longer um, story or, you know, you get more tools or it was just like a general, like there's more some kind of utility from these earlier ones. And that's why it's like better to get an early. I think there was just some yeah, I think like speculation or something. So just, well, I mean, we'll definitely have, you know, future utility that the earlier you're holding, you're going to be getting that utility by, by being here now. Um, and so like, I, I can't say anything specifically right now, but of course, like we're thinking about how do we do airdrops for a lot of the features that are coming next that may have other tokens associated with them. And, and obviously being an early holder is going to mean that you can participate though in those ongoing. And so, um, just to give you an example, I'm not saying, I'm not saying we're going to do this. So please, uh, understand that when I say this, but we're really interested in this idea of how people add different types of media um, to, to the projects. And so like one of them is the NFT and the characters that you own. And another one that people have asked for is music, right? And this is probably further out on the roadmap because a lot of the music ecosystem is not yet um, ready for this type of license, but there are a few projects that are. We can let you pull in a music NFT and use that music in the background of your of, of your story if you have the commercial rights to that music nft and so um many music nfts don't give commercial rights yet and so we're now like partnering and, and figuring out which ones might and you can imagine in the future like um backgrounds and music and other sorts of assets that would be interesting to pull into these stories that that could be com come in the form of like airdrops um potentially or just any other number of things that you know if you're early now like you'll you'll probably get access to as we start to roll them out. So, I mean, definitely for us, um, you know, our earliest supporters are, are the ones that we, we want to make sure um, we, we reward them for, for their early support and, and helping us along the way. And so uh, I think there's going to be a bunch of surprises in store. When we think about a plot with the tools you're going to launch, I can create, take that tool and create a story on that one particular plot. Is that correct? That That's correct. And then there's a very soon after we'll follow up with, like a multiplayer mode where the plot owner, um, imagine like Google Docs where you have multiple collaborators, right? And you can give them different permissions. So you may own a plot and uh, maybe you say like, I just want to contribute my IP, but I want to hire a writer or I have a friend who's a great writer. Um, does, there doesn't have to be a commercial relationship. It could be anything. Um, you, you say like, I'm going to give access to this wallet and they're allowed to write the story or I'm going to give access to this wallet and they're allowed to add IP to this plot. Or I'll give access to this wallet, and actually they're not allowed to edit anything. Um, but I want to give them ten percent of of whatever revenue we make because maybe they'll go promote the story on on Twitter, or maybe they'll go market the story with an ad platform, or who knows? Like you just want to pay them for some reason that isn't even about the creation of the story itself. And so we want to make it really easy to create these these like business relationships where you can have a team that collaborates on the different pieces that matter. Because um, what what we've heard from a lot of people is like they have pretty big ambitions for some of their, their characters. Like if you own some really great IP in this space that you're excited about in a cast, um, you can make something bigger if you, if you work with other people. And so that'll be 
definitely part of it going forward. The first set of tools released this month, uh, we won't have the multiplayer mode, but that is like definitely where we're headed. Taking it from, like you said, like maybe let's say, uh, um, Jay Z has plot number ten thousand. Let's say example. Let's say I own ten thousand one. How would that jump be from that? Like, how, so is it like when when you're sharing that on social, you're sharing your plot, right? So do you expect people to come back to that plot on your website? And that's kind of how you were talking about, like how being next to Jay Z, for example, in this case, would be so beneficial because when people come back to the website, they see that story, and the next one, like kind of like your story, loads right after that. Is that kind of how you were saying that? Yeah. So imagine like. At the end of that story, there's it, you're tapping through these stories, right? And um, we, we probably won't bring you back to the map. Um, we'll probably do is just like literally load up the next story, and there'll be some sort of title screen or like the animation of the, the next story loading. And when you're done with one, the next one is loading up. Um, there may be some other decisions that you can make at the end of the story. We've heard from a lot of people that you, you want to share the story potentially, right? So it's not as if it'll just like autoplay and, and you won't necessarily have any opportunity to do any other action. However, like the next thing that would play um, if you don't want to do those other actions would be would be the, the next story. So we're also creating ways for people to potentially like link plots together that aren't adjacent um, with with certain buttons or, or ways that they can like have a, like a teleport almost. Um, so so there's there's some more complexity to, to like where how you'll be able to let stories navigate throughout the, the different plots. Um, but in general, like if, if there's nothing at the end, then yeah, like you're going to start playing the next one when you when you tap through. And when you say the story, is it like kind of like like you're talking about like IG stories? Basically, you go into the next is and also is it like in, in a mobile like a mobile format or? That that's exactly the right way of thinking about it. So like if you think about like an Instagram story or Snap story, um, you're tapping through, you're seeing these individual images from one person, right? And then when you get done with one person, you're on to the next person, and it's not like that that, that transition is seamless. It's all just one tap. So. That is exactly um, what we're imagining, um, and and yes, it does work on mobile because for us, like we know a lot of blockchain happens on desktop, and people are used to trading on desktop and engaging with MetaMask and all these other things on desktop. Um, mobile experience is is not great. However, consumption for media is is over ninety percent on on mobile. So like uh, it, it's for us like if this has any chance at really being a mass market viral experience with entertainment and media it has to work on mobile so we're actually focused on building the product to successfully work on mobile first rather than the approach many other projects are taking where they're focused on desktop and sort of like bringing it to mobile um in our experience in building a lot of games like usually uh building something on mobile that succeeds is, is harder than building something on desktop and so by solving a lot of those problems up front with the ux and everything um, it's very easy to make something that also can be experienced on, on desktop. And so we are releasing like the, these stories, they, they run great on old devices. They run great on bad connections. Like we, we, we're solving all those hard engineering problems. And honestly, that's, <laughs> that's where a lot of the, the secret sauce is on this project that, that you won't hear people talk about, which is basically how do you get a, a story game that runs, it loads up very quickly um, on the web, anywhere you are, uh, in a game engine that is not in the app store, did not require 100 megabytes of, of download up front on Wi-Fi. Um, how do you make that instant experience happen um, in a way where like it, it, the bandwidth requirements are low and, and you know, it works on all devices? That's, that's very challenging. You can't use Unreal Engine. You can't use Unity. You can't use any of the tools that most game developers use in the app store. It's, it's proprietary stuff that we've been building for a long time. Uh, one one final question regarding ending this thought here. So so these these I love everything you're saying here, but I think the only confusion I have here is so you know I'm guessing the virality will probably come from social like you know these stories going on different platforms right whether it's Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Um, however, where the the way you said like you know you can think of it as like someone going from one story to another story. So the platform where the actual where it's actually or, or like where it's sitting is basically on an app you're creating. Is that correct? No, so so it works within the browser. So if you tap on a, like a link in, in an Instagram bio link or wherever else you can link, you're going to load up within the Instagram browser. If you tap on the link in Twitter, you're loading up inside of Twitter. If you tap on a link inside of Discord, you're loading up there. There's there's zero friction to loading one of these stories, and that's a very I, that's that's an unusual experience right now, and I, that's why I think people have a challenge understanding it because there are very few mobile web games that are out there. 
um, because mobile web games have a problem often um, with discoverability. It's very hard to build technology to make mobile web games that look great and perform great. But that's what we are specialists in. So like the company that's behind this is called Playco. Um, we have about 200 employees. We built games that over 500 million people have played. And we've released the first game on TikTok, the first games on Zoom. We're experts at building games that live inside other applications. Um, and that's not something a lot of game companies focus on right now. So um, for us, like we think that with the way that the Twitter or Twitter crypto and or crypto Twitter, sorry, and, and the rest of the market works, like people don't want to go and download an app and have this, this, this very high friction experience. So publishing these and interacting with these is as easy as a photo or a GIF or a video. Um, it's the same level of friction. You tap in and you tap out. Like that's, that's kind of why we call it the minimum viable metaverse. The point is like if Twitter is the metaverse or Discord is the metaverse, then how do we add a layer of interactivity to that where it's as easy as, as the, using the platforms that you're already on? I finally get it. The light, it just finally clicked. I totally get what you meant by keeping them on the platform and reducing friction makes a lot of sense. When you were chatting about, um, you know, taking actions, the red pill, the, you know, the blue pill within the, within the game itself. Uh, and I wanted to ask this question because, you know, you guys probably are one of the most technical teams out there, like, you know, who understands this very well. Is there, are we at, a, are we at that technically, are we there where these NFTs can become dynamic NFTs? So example, based on action that gets taken, uh, an NFT can change and is it can change based on an action? Like, you know, is that, are we there? I'm just curious about that. Yeah, well, I mean, so the, these plots are, they have this self-contained game story, right? And the state of the plot can change based on the actions people take because you're loading up a, a game engine that's that's got the state and is aware of, of what has happened and what hasn't happened, right? And so in some sense, like the blue pill may only be a one of one. Like we could have somebody who says, you know what? It's just one person. The first person who reads this story and takes the blue pill is the person who ever gets to take they're the only person who ever gets to take that choice because they can set a limited quantity just like any other NFT mint. Um, or there could be a thousand. So in that sense, the NFT does change because when you're experiencing this plot, if somebody took that choice before you, no one else can ever take it again once the quantity is run out. Um, other people might say like it's 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 unlimited, right? Um, they're, they're, you, you can have as many people can mint this choice as, as they want. And then the price will just have to match like whatever the market thinks is interesting and whatever they can um, their followers like want to support based on the creator and their fans. So um, we, we want to leave the system fairly open-ended, but I guess in that sense, like everybody's interacting with each other when they're, when they're playing these stories, because the decisions they make will affect the decisions that the other people who are reading can also make. Um, and, and we could have like this relate to sort of global level constants. Like you think about in a game where there could be some broader um, goal like in, in, in the abstract where people are trying to get to some particular outcome who can collect the most X, right? And you can imagine like, what if we, what if we gave or we airdrop like some particular item um, to everybody and they, they can put it in their reward box. And, and then inside the reward box, they had to distribute these items to people who are reading their stories. And the goal was to get the most of those items by the end of the week or something it's almost like a scavenger hunt where everybody's creating the content, right? Um, and so, and then what if those items are things that you can mix together to create some other item? It's like, we're, we're trying to think about how to, how to let people create their own game that's fun by itself, but then also like have this be interoperable with everything else on the chain, um, which for us, like as, as game designers, I think a lot of people who, who come from a game design background, they're looking at, the blockchain as a way to like facilitate transactions. And um, we're actually much more interested in this idea of back to composability in the building blocks. And like, how do we make this something that people can use for any other number of types of games? And how does this integrate with the Subdux community and the Lazy Lions community and the Apes community individually? They may build their own game with this. They may buy a hundred plots and build like a very detailed story game just for the Apes. Um, but then again, like their community or that story game can also very easily connect to uh, a story game that another community made. Like, so it could be that the, the crypto punks and the apes like can very easily um, interact when they want to in their story game. So there's like multiple levels of creation here where there's the individual. It's so easy to create a game. Anyone can do it. 
there's the community where you're going to have communities that want to buy very large blocks of these and create a game that's sort of like a semi-official version of what the community wants. Um, and then there's this idea of like the community voting into uh, official canon, which like I can create a story with my my apes, um, and and if other apes want to vote that story into like an, an elevated status, if they own an ape and they use the ink token, they can vote up that story. And so you can imagine, like to get back to this point of how these are distributed, there are additional ways to like to highlight the discoverability of of these these particular stories. And so one way is you just share a link, right? Um, another way might be that uh, Yuga Labs decides that they want to officially show like the stories of the community like the most. And maybe on the Apes website, they have a stories page where um, people can actually vote up the stories that contained Apes to be elevated, to be shown on their website and, and like featured. Um, and, and so this idea of what's official canon means like what gets sort of the official stamp of approval from the community and, and the community can vote on what becomes canon and what doesn't. And so there are a lot of like levels of collaboration that we're trying to solve for. But the, the net of it is like a lot of these communities, these IP based communities, they wanted to create games. And in many of them, uh, they don't have the team to create games, but they have the IP and they have the funds um, and they have the people, the community. And so they just need a different type of tool that allows them to take all that energy and the capital and the IP they have to go and create these larger experiences. And so we'll see stuff that's um, Hollywood teams that 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 pick out a cast and buy some NFTs and, and go get pro screenwriters to create content. We'll see um, very game design focused teams who come out of mobile games who, who see this as an opportunity to work with some really cool IP and like prototype some adventure game ideas and focus a lot on the mechanics and how what people are getting rewarded for and creating the scavenger hunt ideas we talked about. Um, so we'll see people focus on story. We'll see people focus on the game mechanics. And then we'll see communities that see this as a way to show like just what their IP can mean and to tell the lore of, of their, their IP. And so you can imagine um, a lot of communities have spent a, a bunch of time on this, but it's buried in their discord, right? They've written these long lores that are somewhere deep in their discord that most people can't consume. This is like a very highly consumable, shareable viral format for them to go take all that work they've already done and then put it into something that everybody can um, really get to experience it. In. Um, and so our goal here really is just like to make the cost of creating uh, this type of content to be not free, but like as, as easy as possible. Um, and, and that way, like basically turn everybody into more of a pro production studio in terms of their capabilities from an individual to, to like a much larger group. You talked about the ownership that's, you know, in the metaverse. I want to tie this with Storyverse. So like, I would love to talk about your, you know, the ink uh, currency token or currency you are thinking about within your platform. And then also like, how will people make money from their stories? Ink is the currency that, that drives the Storyverse uh, as a platform. And the right way to think about this is, is the same way that uh, Sandbox has its own currency, Sand. And many of the transactions that happen within the sandbox are, are powered by sand or Decentraland has its own currency called mana. Um, and many of those transactions are powered by mana. Uh, many of the transactions that happen inside Storyverse will be powered by ink. Um, and so it'll be the, the means of exchange uh, inside this ecosystem. The first and most obvious thing that we've already talked about where this will come into play is, is on these proof of choice uh, tokens. And so I've, I mentioned earlier, like pricing them in ETH. Um, but when ink is available, they will be priced in ink. And so when it comes to creating these choices that people can take in the stories, um, that'll be priced in ink. And you can think about like what, what's, what's interesting about these choices is they may become collectible. Um, and behind the choices with these reward boxes we talked about, it could be even um, a game where like they could be, become profitable for the reader. So you can imagine like there's a one in 10 chance of winning some um, some NFT on the other side of that choice that's more valuable than the cost of taking that choice, right? And so maybe not everybody um, has a wins in that sense of the game, but like somebody might pay a hundred ink to take that choice. And then the, the item they get on the other side is worth 500 ink and maybe 10 people took that choice. And so the creator made a profit of 500 ink because the 10 people took a hundred yen, or sorry, hundred yen, I've been living in Japan too long, a hundred ink choice. Um, 
then there was a, there was a thousand a thousand ink, and there was a five hundred ink item on the other side. So they made a five hundred ink profit, and so you can see how this lets people create some simple sort of games where the creator can make a profit while still giving value back to the community. That's not just um, like the story content itself. Like there could actually be a real ability for people to build like um, play to earn style mechanics. I wouldn't call it play to earn, but it's like this idea that that it is possible for, for you to have like profitable transactions and not just support the creator, depending on what type of content they want to create. I'm sure there'll be other people who who don't focus on having to give away value like that. And it's just that they're so famous that they make it they make it very limited um, how many people can take a choice and just being able to take that choice is valuable. So maybe kissing somebody's punk if they're a very prominent member of the community is, is something that people want proof that they did um, in that story. And, and like just that NFT could be valuable. And there's future utility associated with it where there's airdrops that come. And, and maybe you'll see communities like very famous PFP communities that build stories where um, they, they allow their community to participate in, and unlock more things within their ecosystem. So you take a choice um, to like, you know, befriend a certain character in a story that's related to the cool cats or something. And later on, the cool cats will reward you for having that NFT. They could do an airdrop to the people who did that, right? You could launch a new NFT project with this. So to get back to the marketing side, you could, you could actually control who gets whitelist access based on who took a certain choice in the story, right? Um, so there's really like, I think when it comes to how are these a business, it's it's almost as broad as, as a web page with like a transaction sort of capability built in. And so some people might not look be looking to make a profit. They may see this as a promotional tool. Hmm. And other people might be purely thinking about like how do I how do I create like a longer term game where I have hundreds of stories and there's like a very advanced RPG where you need this item to do this part and this item to do this part and they're all connected and they build like a very profitable game. Um, with with the, the whole ecosystem. So we're not really like forcing people into one sort of situation or another. And I think we're going to learn what people are most excited about um, once we get the tools out and we start letting people collaborate. So it's, it's really just very few systems that unlock a lot of creativity. I can also see like some kind of crowdsourcing as well, right? Where like you see, you can think about an influencer crowdsourcing it to their fans to create stories and, you know, might get approved and they can share profits with them or whatever, but it's a great way to like kind of get uh, yeah, crowdsourcing. Yeah, interesting. Yep. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to collaborate with with your fans for sure. Um, you could do a casting call, right? Like if, if you're well known on Twitter, you don't even have to be well known. You could just ping your friends in a Discord, um, and and ask like who else wants to be in the story with me, and you could get people to volunteer their commercial rights by being collaborators on a plot. And um, if you're successful, like maybe you do another one. We think organically, you know, these things will start to grow. Where like if if someone succeeds in doing this. Um, they could say, well, like, let's do that again and again and again. And they're amassing this capital and they're building a team and they're building a brand. Like we, we're hoping to see more of that. We, we want to see more uh, collaboration. That's not just like where the goal is to get, to get in Netflix, because that is the goal for a lot of these projects. And that's, that's a great goal. Um, but it, it shouldn't be so binary. Like, you know, you're either on Netflix or you're not. Um, I mean, there should be a lot of room in, in between there for amazing storytelling um, where like the bar is, is, is much lower to create high quality content. And so, um, yeah, I mean, TikTok is kind of like the great example where like one person can make super engaging, high quality, entertaining content, um, that it's not the same as going and watching like a, a full production on Netflix, but there's a time and place for it. And it could be, um, even more interesting than that content when, when it's the type of content you're looking for. And I, I think that there will be that like, and, and this is, this is basically a tool to create that. Um, and, and also like the longer form stuff, when people start really saying like, I want to take this seriously. And we've seen a lot of creators that, that, where they turn their, their whole life into a business of being a creator and an influencer. And we're hoping that people that are very successful with this can take it and like build a, you know, a real company. Think about this quite a bit. Like, you know, when you think about Twitch, it's such a, there's such a bar because you have to put your face out there. Like, it's like, let's say, People love to watch people playing video games or doing things like, you know, what like, assume I'm sure people are watching people like, you know, a group of people like, you know, their, their kind of interactions or like how they're doing something. Right. But you have to always put your face out there. 
but it's interesting because with your platform in that sense, you can actually kind of think of that as a Twitch, but like with an avatar in a sense, right? So you, it's, you're putting your personality out there, but not necessarily your face out there if you don't want to put your face out there, which is also a pretty interesting way to look at it. Yeah, I think this is why people like the idea of avatars. So when I when I mentioned avatars before as being part of the metaverse that that I was less excited about, I mean more like in the three D virtual world right. space because because I do think avatars in the asynchronous world are important. Like back to this idea of we're already living in the metaverse. Twitter, if you're using a pseudonym and an avatar, um, you're already living this life where you can speak more freely because uh, your your words are attributed to you, but not necessarily the real your real name and your, your, your real life. And so um, that gives people like an, a, an extra ability to, to express themselves in a way that they might not feel comfortable doing if, if their real identity is attached to it. And I think that is really powerful. And I think the asynchronous form of it is where, where it's not live is great because it, it makes it easy to share. So live communities have this challenge where there's often an empty room and the people that you care about are rarely there. So, you know, in a former life, I built the world's largest free poker room um, at my last company, Zynga. And even though it was the world's largest free poker room, and it was still pretty hard to catch your friend on there at the same time. It was very, very hard. Um, and it was absolutely huge. So, but, but, but still, it would be a moment of delight and rarity when, when somebody actually showed up that you knew in real life. And we did everything we could to get you on the same table when that happened, but it just didn't happen that often. And so I think that the, the numbers that are required to get that sort of overlap where like some, two people are online at the same time is something that a lot of these um, projects are not necessarily acknowledging. And so uh, the nice thing about asynchronous communication, you don't need to be there when somebody wrote that tweet. You, you watched it or you read it later. Um, and this story and this content is valuable even if you weren't there the moment it was created. And it could be valuable 10 days later, it could be valuable a year later. Um, that's that's what asynchronous content is great for. And so in that sense, um, when I get back to this concept of like, why could this be the minimal viable metaverse? It's because like for where the community is at right now, for how big Web3 is right now, we need more content that outlives the moment you were there. And I'm seeing this incredible content of people going and DJing in the metaverse and having these parties and these events. But then whenever I show up, there's no one there. And I don't know. I, I'm just never, I'm on the wrong time zone, right? Like I'm in Japan. So maybe, maybe every time I show up, all the parties are over, but, but to me, um, I never get to experience that. And so I, I do think that maybe we'll get to a point where parties are running around the clock um, and, and that works. So I think that the opportunity here is, is to give people an asynchronous way to use these, these characters that may or may not be their, their avatars. And in this sense, they can say something to the world, just like they're saying something on Twitter but they can do it in a rich and interactive way. And for some people, that'll be their personal identity. It'll be um, what they want to say and in the same way that they speak on Twitter, but they want to say it in a way that's more fun and engaging. And for other people, they'll want to create personalities for the other, the each of the characters they have that aren't about them. And so like for us, we know a lot of people have explored the avatar piece of this character represents me, but um, there's still like not a lot of, exploration out there of what it means for these these PFPs, these NFTs to be their own characters. And what we might see in the future is you can imagine like why are, you know, are Tom Cruise and, and uh, Will Smith like such bankable actors? Why are they so valuable? It's, it's partially because of the content that they've been in. We've seen the movies they're in. They're great movies. Um, they're great actors, but also they're in great movies. And when we think about like these characters in the NFT ecosystem, right now people value them based on their traits and what makes them rare. But in the future, people might value them based on what they're associated with, which stories were they in, um, and how good were those stories? How many people saw those stories? There was that, that TikTok collab the other day. I'm not sure if you saw it, this Crypto Boy song where um, people, yeah. like it went very, very viral and it, it was cool. Like it was one of those open verse challenges that people do on TikTok where somebody sang a song about crypto and like a few other people from the space gave their verses and it went super viral. It was a lot of fun. Um, I think, and, and, and they became notable because of that, right? And, and I think you're going to see that same thing happen with, with characters where like this particular board ape becomes very famous relative to the others. 
and it may not have the rarest traits, but now it is like one of the most recognizable apes. What does that do to its its uh, its secondary value on a market like OpenSea versus these other apes? Like, do you want the ape that's famous and the, the ape that's in all this these games and this this content, or do you want the ape that has none of that content? Like, it's going to be another new way to think about um, which of these PFPs are are valuable and interesting. Yeah, like like Jenkins the Valet and Punk six five two nine again. When, as more and more interactive stuff happens, they get more and more famous. Yeah. Makes all sense. So let's say this is like a huge success, and and the plots go to like let's say two two ETH uh, each. When it comes time to release more plots, are you going to price it at like kind of lower to kind of expand distribution to more people, or are you going to try to keep it at like near what the market's currently valuing it at? Yeah, this is this is a great question. I mean, I think like our our responsibility right now is to um, to make sure we do right by the holders, right? So, um, like, we don't want to <laughs> we don't want to price it in a way that that um, puts like too much downward pressure on on the people who hold plots. I don't know exactly how how we end up end up doing that, but if there is a lot of excess demand, um, you know, you can you can see us selling like blocks that are close enough to market that we're not, we're not like creating too much downward pressure. We haven't created the exact sort of way we would do that, but there have been other projects who do this by auctioning, um, you know, the sort of new land that's going out there. So we have a lot of examples from other metaverse projects. And honestly, it'll be like a conversation with the community to make sure we do something that everybody feels is fair. Cause I think it's in the best interest of everybody um, to get more plots out there because this project will um, in some sense market itself. The more holders we have creating interesting and good content and there's going to be some really large buyers that we want to come in with like great IP or very big partnerships who are going to like really make everybody hear about this, this project. Um, and then there's going to be individual community members who do amazing things with it too. And so everybody benefits when more people are using uh, Storyverse. So I, I think we're aligned on that and we just have to figure out a way to do it where we're not like creating, you know, unintentional downward pressure on, on the price for people that already hold. Justin, we can talk about like a bunch of different things. I want to like just keep on picking your brain, but I know your 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 time is very valuable. So I want to end this with just asking you about your favorite NFT projects. Obviously, I know you have an APFP, so obviously you love apes. Uh, and one that, and also people in the space you really respect. I would love to know more about that. Hmm. Okay, one of the one of the projects I really love that's more recent is the MFers. I just think they're I, I think it's hilarious, and I think um, I like that they show that there's multiple ways to win. I think there's been some projects who they've each, the, the biggest projects in the space have all taken a different angle at what kind of sets them apart from the other projects. And I think that's key. Like you need to have something that makes your community unique enough that it, when you look at some of the projects that are like too closely a derivative of any other project, they rarely get to that sort of like blue chip top or even like top 50 sort of status. It's all about carving out your, your unique area. And, for me, um, MFers to be able to do that with that style of art and everything is is just really cool. Like I, I think that that was that's not something people were expecting. Like if you ask somebody, is the next project going to be like a crayon style drawing of stick figures? Probably nobody would believe you. But it just shows how much we don't know in this space, and they are recognizable. They they actually they, they have all the traits of something that you would you would want in great IP. Like you don't mistake an MFer when you see it, but they are still so simple. So there's a lot of space to create interesting IP. And I, I also love it because it's not the type of thing that like a studio executive would say, okay, let's go make a cartoon and they look like MFers or let's go make a game. And this is the new art. If, if your artist submitted that, you'd say, like, you know, <laughs> this is a joke, right? But, but people love it and that's why it works. And so um, I, I like that NFTs are enabling that sort of thing to happen because I don't think that if we were building a new game, at Playco or, or like if someone submitted this as art, it's not something we could take seriously, but the market loves it. And, and it's clear that this type of thing does work. So we're going to see new things that would not pass the sort of um, the sniff test from like a group of people who have to decide what do we do next? And so we're going to see all sorts of cool new IP uh, come out of that. In terms of people I, I look up into in the space, I mean, um, wow. Okay. Well, I think a lot of them are probably like on the, earlier on, on, on the, just like in the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, so just uh, I, like, I've, I've obviously like, I've, I've known the quant stamp team for a long time, um, Richard and the team. And, and I've been like, since I guess like 2017 or 2018, lucky to be involved with uh, some very early projects in the space 
people like Ari from Decentraland um, and like the original CryptoKitties teams, people like Mac or um, these types of people have helped me when I was first getting into the space. And what I was able to offer was some advice about games. They were able to, to really get me up to speed on the NFT market. And so I've been lucky to um, be able to make this this trade where, you know, I came into the space at the, the earliest days and was very curious. And like the people who were working on the coolest things at that time took me on board um, and I, we were able to, to learn from each other. And so that was like a really cool um, position to be in that then made me have the, like the, the basic sort of understanding of the space I needed over the last four or five years to to see the opportunity where we could contribute now. And so even though I haven't um, built a, a project in this space yet, I've been lucky to be involved with with some really great ones. Um, and and as an advisor to those teams like Decentraland and, and Dapper. And so I, I, I think for me, like um, I look up to the teams that have shipped big projects in this space. Uh, and, and, I, and I think like that's what I'm most excited about is building a new layer that, um, that helps move the space forward. Like when we saw CryptoKitties, everybody understood that this was something new that you could do on this, this uh, on Ethereum. And same thing with Top Shot, it really expanded people's minds on what was possible in Decentraland. And so um, we want Storyverse to be one of those projects where like you can look at it and then from that point, and from that point, like people understood there's a new model here. There's another whole new set of interesting things to go explore. So. Um, really it's, it's the builders who have been able to, to, to actually keep the space moving forward in some way. And I think the media side of that is just getting started. So our, my hope is like, we get to basically help show like one interesting path forward for the way, um, you can reinvent the entertainment industry with the blockchain. Amazing. Thanks, Justin. Is there anything else that you want to add as a call to action that will be helpful for, uh, for your project? Well, yeah, look, I mean. Storyverse is super early. So we sold out our first mint of plots, but as you heard in the interview, um, there's more coming. And, and honestly, um, it's, it's, you know, it's a tough market right now. So, so uh, it, for us, like we're, we're lucky to be building. We're well-funded. We have uh, the parent company, Playco. Um, we've raised like a hundred, over a hundred million dollars from investors like Sequoia. So we're not in a situation where we're in, uh, we're lucky to be in a situation where we're not uh, at risk because of what's going on right now, where we're excited to go build for the long term and build something big and interesting here. Um, I, I, I would just anyone who's passionate about storytelling or creating a game and who's always felt like it's been too difficult and asked too much of them. I think now is the time where you can come in and you can contribute in any way, um, any small way to make something really interesting and be a part of this ecosystem. For us, um, I think so many people have had the dream of, of creating a, a movie or a story or or game and our, our hope is to like give all those people a place where they can do it and um it's still super early uh we are a utility project where we're building this it's going to be um our alpha for the creator tools it, it's releasing this month this is recorded in may and so like this is it's very very early on this project um and if you want to get involved and, and give us feedback and be a part of, of creating it now is the time to come check it out so um we've got a great community and like anybody who's Who's, whether you come from like a background in storytelling, some we've had people come in from Hollywood or, or in games, all the way to somebody who just loves their NFTs and wants to make them talk. It doesn't matter. Um, I, I think like there's going to be space for all of it, and we're we're really trying to figure out how to go and build the best uh, the best ecosystem. So, yeah, come and come and join. Check it out. Give us your feedback, and you know it's it's very very early. So uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Justin, for taking the time. This was this was amazing, man. Thank you so much yeah, for coming. Thank you.